1 Timothy, the first of the pastoral epistles, there's 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. Um, those ones were written by Paul to men who were taking churches and called to shepherd, called to lead, called to protect, called to encourage, called to exhort, called to be an example to, called to, and you can just fill in like 50 more blanks. First Timothy, we've been learning so far, there's young Timothy the pastor in the city of Ephesus, lots of attack happening or really starting to happen. People were coming along and saying, you know this whole gospel message of yours, this whole good news of Jesus that you're saved by grace through faith. It's not of your own works, lest any man should boast. It is a gift from God because that is the message of Christianity. You are saved not by your works, not by my works, but by the grace of God. We are saved not by anything we did, but by everything Jesus did. And that was to die for us on the cross 2,000 years ago. You know, if, if you're here this morning and you don't, you, you're not a Christian, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, let those words that I just spoke resonate, okay? What did the pastor say? He said, I could be saved, which means eternity with God as his child. And he said that I don't have to work for it. Like, like I don't have to be good. I don't have to be more good than I am bad because a lot of people think that. Yeah, that's what the pastor said because that's what the Bible says. It says God loves you so much that he gave his son. That's Jesus. Jesus was perfect and sinless and yet he died in your place. You know why? Because sin, the consequence, the Bible says, is death. And if you had to die for your own sin, listen, then that means eternity separated from God. It's, an, it's, it's, a, it's a gift God gives you that you receive by faith. Jesus died in your place. He paid the penalty. And when you do receive him by faith, the Bible says you are born again. You are adopted into the family of God once and for all. You don't lose your salvation. You become a child of God. Life is transformed. That is the message of the gospel. That is what every preacher is called to preach. That is what every Christian is called to go and tell. That's the gospel message. So, if you haven't accepted Jesus by faith, at the end of our message this morning, I'm going to give you that opportunity, okay? Just allow yourself to hear. Allow God to speak to your heart. And then at the end, I want you, please, to make that important decision that will change your life. Not just change your life, transform your life, and then give you eternal life. Paul was there, I mean, Paul was writing to a man, Timothy, who was the pastor of this church, and people were saying no go to the gospel. They were saying things like, in order to be saved, you must follow the rules. You must follow the law. Actually, what this doctrine means is more than what Paul tells you or what the word of God explains. These were called false teachers. And every pastor is called to protect the flock against false teachers. I am held to account by heaven for every word that I speak to you from this pulpit. If I tell you, thus saith the Lord, man sakes, Raj, it better be thus saith the Lord, right? Because I'm answering to God for that. And we are to make sure that that's the teaching you receive. And to dare hear somebody come and malign the word. To, to dare twist the doctrine of God. Well, pity them. 
but also we are to keep those from the church. And Paul said, hey, son, that's what you got to do. Remember, even some from inside the church would rise up. They would let their minds go. They wouldn't stay close to the Lord and, and stay, on, stay on target as far as the Bible goes. And then their doctrine started getting all weird. And, and they actually had to, they had to remove people from the church. They had to impose church discipline. Not just to kick them out and keep them out, but to do that so that they would realize the error of their ways and repent and turn and say, no, no, wait, I get it. I can't believe that I twisted the word of God. And they come to Jesus. They seek his forgiveness. They come back to the church. The church forgives and receives. That's what the church does. And it is primarily the responsibility of the pastor to make sure that those things happen. The pastors and the elders at this church, this is what we are commissioned to do. Now, of course, in this day and age, the principles of the doctrine extend to you. You don't have to have a pulpit to make sure nobody twists the Bible. You don't have to be called a pastor to make sure that what you speak to people isn't spot on biblical. Do not deviate, saith the Lord. When you see people who do, correct them. Speak with the authority of God's word. Let them know. Tell them this is not right. You're not to go in that direction and draw them back. You guys, this happens and we have an important responsibility. Okay, so Paul writes to Timothy and says, son, this is what you got to do. And we talked about the discipline last week. Well, now we go on in chapter two. I'm going to say basically through to the end of the, of the letter, okay? Chapter six. In essence, Paul says now it's time to talk about pastoring the people. Here's what I want you to be teaching them and calling them to. And so we learn, like today, it'll be about prayer. Um, it'll be about how men and women are supposed to act in the church, it's about how we're supposed to, you know, uh, treat widows. It's about how we raise up leadership in the church. It's just really practical stuff, but it's important stuff for the church to, to, um, to, to practice faithfully, I, I would say energetically, in order to be a force for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you see churches, you guys that stray, you see churches that they have their priorities all out of whack, and they are not. They, they're just sitting there. They're in idle. Now, God's given them turbocharged engines. We're supposed to put them in gear and take off. But when churches have their priorities all messed up and they don't follow this stuff, ugh, what a waste. Okay, that's not this church. Uh, we got it revved. We got it in gear. Uh, we're going, and that's the way I want to keep it, and that's all of us, not just me, but that's all of us. Okay, so like I said, prayer, let's get into it. Chapter, uh, first Timothy chapter 2, let's pray first, huh? Let's take this to the Lord. God, this is, it is all by you. It's all for you. This is your perfect will. This is your nourishment for our souls. Holy Spirit, you are our power, our strength. Jesus, oh yeah, we acknowledge you alone as Savior, as Lord. And our Father in heaven, we are grateful to be called sons and daughters. And right now, we, your sons and daughters, we pray that you would anoint this time. Um, Holy Spirit, that you would prepare, uh, prepare every one of our hearts to receive your word. And Lord, to receive it and understand it and Lord, to understand it and apply it. And when we apply it, it is for the purpose you've called us to. It's to share Jesus. It's to glorify you. And so Lord, have your way in all of our hearts. And God, if you have brought anybody here this morning who doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus, Lord, we pray for them today, right now. It would be the day of their salvation. And we pray it in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.
This is such a cool study, you guys. Look, follow with me. I'm going to read from verses 1 through 8, and then we will, as some say, unpack it together. First of all, okay, here's Paul. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, that's a key word, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this, I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying because everybody was accusing Paul, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Okay, here's the way we'll do it. Five key aspects that I see um, involved in prayer. Five key aspects of prayer that Paul wants Pastor Timothy to understand and convey. Okay, so let's go for it. I'm going to go one by one, and you fill it out in your notes. Check this out. Firstly, he goes, first of all, I urge prayer. In other words, prayer is always the priority. (laughs) You're going to see a commonality to all my words in just a minute. Prayer is always the priority. You know that word urge? It's just like the word charge When Paul told Timothy, I charge you to wage the good warfare. I command it. Son, I am telling you this. This is not a suggestion. This is what you and every Christian and the church of Christ, this is what you do. You pray. You commune with God. You speak to him. You you open your heart to him. You have a dialogue with him. You make sure that this is always the top, the top of the, this should be the top of the list. And you guys, let's face it. How easy is this to trickle down the list five or eight places or 10 places? Praying to God first. That's what the Lord wants of us. It's just, it's too easy. I was um, thinking about the ministries of the church. We have so many events going on. We have places for you and me to get involved in. And when we have prayer ministry or prayer events, here's just the truth. They are never the best attended. They just aren't. They're generally speaking some of the lowest attended. And yet here saith the Lord, pray to me, speak to me. I care about that. You know, the church was birthed in prayer. Huh? You go to Acts chapter 1, and you know what they were doing in the upper room? They're together as Christians, and they're praying. And that's when sort of the body of Christ emerges. It says in Acts chapter 2, that when the people gathered together then as the church, remember what they did? They gathered together in the apostles' doctrine. We do that. They gathered together in fellowship. We do that. They gathered together in breaking of bread. That means communion. We do that. Eating. Oh, we do that. And prayer. We do that. No doubt. Um, Acts chapter 3, I'll keep going down the list. Acts chapter 3, Peter and John go to the temple. Why? For the hour of prayer. Acts chapter 6, in the church, the widows were being neglected in receiving the food distribution. Now, the apostles hear about it, and what is their solution? They go, you know what? We're going to appoint seven godly men, deacons, And we're going to let them handle this issue. You know why? Because we will devote ourselves to prayer 
and the ministry of the word. And I could go chapter after chapter after chapter. Prayer was priority. Prayer was the top of the list. You guys, this church, that's what I want. That's what God wants of you and me together. Make prayer your priority, okay? Let's like smack each other and say, did you pray today? <laughs> Don't take that literally, okay? Because there are some of you, you're like, yeah, I'm going to smack him around. <laughs> Encourage each other. Be an example to each other. I prayed today. To th this morning in my prayer time. At men's prayer, this is what Nate talked about. And then we prayed about it. I don't know, just let's get it moving. Let's get the fire, man, an inferno. And I know there's so much energy for prayer in this place. But you know, unfortunately, there's some of you, you're not that energetic for prayer. Remember, this is a letter to the pastor to tell the people. The pastor is telling the people. Prayer is a priority. Uh, it's, look, again, it's so easy to do ministry, huh? It's easy to get plugged in. You can sign up for the Thanksgiving thing. You can give your donations. I get it. It's so easy for me to just spend hours on my message. I, I read commentaries and I write notes. It's so easy then to go, oh, six hours ago when I started, um, I didn't pray. It's cake. It's easy to do, no doubt. Okay, these are the kinds of things, though, to let, to, 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 to let happen. Um, the most, the, 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 well, I'll, I'll get to something in just a minute that's like I'm ready to just speak it out, but I won't. Um, in, in talking to other pastors, in, you know, I got friends who are other pastors here in this community. I sort of summarized something that we all agreed to. Okay, it'll be on the screen. I want you to look at this. Churches are most influential and powerful when prayer is a priority. That was like we were in 100% agreement to that truth. If you want to be really inspired, you know, um, in reading, there's, a, there's an author, a preacher from the late 1800s, E.M. Bounds is his name. And whoa, you read his stuff and all you're going to want to do is stand on your rooftop and pray. Anyway, I have a few quotes. I want you to listen to some of these. He said this, praying is the mightiest agent to advancing God's work. He said this, when the people pray, each person's prayer is like a drop of water and all come together like a mighty ocean that defies resistance. He's right. Okay, but then there's the flip side. Okay, listen. When someone backslides, almost always the first thing that went was their prayer life. One more. The least effective believers in the church are usually the least praying believers in the church. We can all just let those rest in our hearts and know is that the case for you? Is that the case for me? Ah, there's truth. Totally, you guys. Listen, Paul said, first of all, prayer is priority. Then what? He goes on, verse one. I've given you the word variety. There is variety in prayer. Notice supplications, prayers, I'll explain that, intercessions, and thanksgiving. Thanksgivings, okay? Okay. A kind of different content in, in your prayers. Now, supplications, um, those are prayers that stem from a sense of need. Okay, they stem from a sense of, of need. And so you go to God and you say, Lord, I have need. Lord, supply for my needs. You know, that's, we go to God for that, no doubt about it. Years ago, years ago, when I heard a pastor teaching on this idea, hey, supplication, you pray for needs, I wrote an interesting little note to myself I never forget. Supplication is selfless selfishness. 
I wish I would have put it on the screen, but I forgot. It's selfless selflessness. Let me explain. So supplication is you going to God and saying, God, I need give. God, I need give. God, I have this void. Fill. So it sounds like it's selfish, but actually at its core, it is selfless because what you're saying is, God, I have a need of you because I want to get rid of the me that's taken over. God, I need your power because I keep trying to do it in my own power. Your power, not mine. You get the concept there? So yeah, you're saying need, but you're saying, God, you first. God, everything that you can supply, put that at the top, and I'll take it. I'll run with it. I'll use it. God, I need more of you in my life and less of me. God, I want to desire the things of Christ, the things of the Bible, not the things of my flesh. I have need. God, I need your forgiveness because the Holy Spirit has shown me the sinful way that I am uh, practicing I, want, I turn, I, I need your forgiveness. Wash me. Send me into a new place in your righteousness. God, I have need of every gift of the Spirit that you will give me because I know that in myself, I can only go so far. In myself, I certainly can't go all the way to the effectiveness you desire. You guys, that's selfless selfishness. So it's a good thing to be selfish in those prayers as long as they are selfless at the core. Um, supplic supplication, prayer, it's a, it's a form of prayer that I think should be a lifestyle. Okay, I've, I've told you this before, that prayer is a lifestyle. And the idea of praying for those needs, the selfless selflessness, it should just be an ongoing thing in your mind and in your heart. You know, you guys, when I'm walking up to the stage and I, I know I'm about, about to give a message, I'm still like, Lord, I'm me? Like, I can't do this, God, please. I pray for your love for the people. I pray for your wisdom I pray to convey this in a way that you desire so that their hearts are struck. I mean, you guys, I could just get into professor mode and just be like, number one, number two, good day to you. You know, it's, it's so easy. That's like my default mode. And so it's like, Lord, you know, just turn, I'm yours. I'm clay in your hands. And that's the way your life should be. Whatever it is, Lord, I'm clay in your hands. Do whatever I have need of you. Get rid of me. I have need of you. Um, uh, what else? So, so in um, studying God's word, in supplication, in my devotion on Friday, the Lord took me to the most awesome example of supplication. By the way, when you supplicate, that's a verb, that means you're asking for your need to be supplied. So you'll say something like, I supplicated, I'm supplicating. It's, it's a fair word, okay? It's, I know it's a little <laughs> theological, but it's still, it's still spot on. Um, oh, Jesus in the garden. Huh? It's incredible. When you see it through this spotlight right here, there is Jesus and he is on his face and he is bleeding drops of blood, um, Luke chapter 22. And he turns to his father and he says, oh, father, oh, dad, oh, my precious one who I've been with since eternity past, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. You know what Jesus needed? What Jesus needed was an intimacy that's beyond you or we can even imagine. He said, right at this moment, there is a void that I need you to fill. And it, it's something, you guys, the only expression we could get here was drops of blood, sweat, the savior of the world on his face. And he's calling out, not, can't do it. 
You guys, that's supplication. That's saying, I have need, and I need you to fill it. Isn't that marvelous, huh? Isn't that the most incredible thing? James chapter 5 and verse 16. The earnest prayer of a righteous person. I I did this in New Living Translation. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. The key there, I wanted you to know, the response is a promise. Would you just notice that? Has great power and produces wonderful results. Those are absolutes. It's going to happen. Now, I know we're people and sometimes we want it to happen our way, but here's the deal when you supplicate. The answer will come. The need will be met, saith the Lord. It's, it's a powerful thing. So Paul says the first thing is first supplicate. All right, now the second one in his list, remember the variety, is, is this one, uh, pros UK. It's the word prayers and not in what we're talking about just saying, you know, oh, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This particular word refers to speaking worship and adoration to God. Okay, it's all about worshiping and revering God. <laughs> you, just, you just pray at the um, men's prayer. What's so cool is we open it and the guys naturally just start adoring God. We just start worshiping God. God, you are so good. Lord, you are so worthy. Jesus, you alone are the savior of the world. You know, we're just, we're just throwing these worshipful sentences up to heaven, knowing that the ears of God are receiving them. That's what prayers mean here. Okay, very simply there. And then he talks about this. Let's, let's move on in variety. He talks about intercession intercessions. Very simply, it means praying for someone else. That's its most basic definition. When you, you guys, you pray for the needs of another person. That's you interceding for them. You're, um, you've heard it this way, you're standing in the gap. You're standing in the gap for somebody else leading them toward the Lord, the Lord toward them. That's a pretty cool little image. But I know a lot of you have prayer lists. A lot of you keep these lists, you know, things. Some of you will actually walk up to me and say, so Raj, you know, what can I pray for? And you like hold out this paper and, it, and you write down some need that I have. Okay, that's you saying, I want to intercede. Prayer lists are good, you guys, because part of the call of prayer is to intercede. That's what lists, that's what the list is. You know, husbands and wives, we should be on the other person's list. Number one, pray. Lord, I I need to lift up Missy. I need to say, God, may just you fill her with your power first. Lord, would you just meet all of her needs? And I know some of those needs and I can pray for some of those individually. And I know that in her own time, she's lifting me up. And guys and gals, that's what we do. For our children, we pray for them. For our parents, we pray for them. So many of you have interceded for my dad. You've stood in the gap. By the way, he's still healing slowly. I, I've, I've had some conversations. Keep, keep praying. Keep interceding, okay? Keep interceding. This is what it's all about. You pray for each other because you've, given, you've been given the ability, huh? The sweet privilege. You know, Jesus, how many times he interceded for us? Oh, always. In fact, that's what he's doing right now in heaven, interceding for you. Oh, uh, uh, Father, no, what what Satan is saying, that's a lie. Oh, that's another lie. Raj is righteous. Raj is holy. (laughs) Don't worry, Raj is not righteous in himself, okay? Raj is righteous, Father, because I, I was the gift that you gave. That's what the Lord says, and he intercedes. So be like Jesus, intercede. All right, number four variety, giving thanks. You know, I hope that is so obvious. <laughs> hey, we're in Thanksgiving, giving thanks. The whole reason that this holiday was established. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. And that's another thing you find at the men's prayer. We will, we will go right into the thank yous too. Thank you for dying on the sin, on the cross for our sins. 
Thank you, Lord, for forgiveness. Thank you for grace. And guys, are just, we're just speaking it out because we can't help it. He's so worthy, isn't he? Isn't he so worthy of being, thankful, of being thanked? Sometimes it's on my devotions the other day. Um, the Lord said, I want you just to spend this time. Actually, it was the day. Today, only in your prayers, giving thanks. That was it. Nothing else, just giving thanks. How fulfilling, how right that is because of who God is. So anyway, so Paul says, hey, church, do you want to roll in this world of darkness? Do you want to light up this place? Make prayer a priority. And when you pray, here are elements of your prayer. And then what does he say going on about this? It's this. He says, to, let's, let's move on here in verses um, 1 and 2. We go from priority to variety to, and here's what I put, the word entirety. And I think I might have already written this out for you, okay? Let's see if you can figure out why. Shouldn't be too hard. So your prayer is supposed to be for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions. That's all. I put we pray for the entirety of humanity. For all people, um, pray for believers, please. And pray for unbelievers, please. Pray for the people you like, please. <clears throat> oh, oh, <clears throat> and pray for your enemies, please. <laughs> Don't pray like David in Psalm 58, oh Lord, break the teeth in their mouths. <laughs> Don't say that. Instead, honor Jesus. What did he say in his Sermon on the Mount? Pray for those who persecute you. Huh? Luke chapter 6. Pray for those who mistreat you. You know that word, mistreat, is translated abuse. Pray for those who abuse you. How can we do that in our flesh, you guys? How? You can't. We can't. That's why you supplicate and you say, Lord, in this prayer for that man, for that woman who dared to do that to me, I need your power and I need your love and I need your grace. And then the Holy Spirit gives you power and he gives you love and he gives you grace. And then you know what you say? I pray, I lift up that man. I lift up that woman to you. I pray you would transform their hearts in Jesus' name. And I pray that you would demonstrate your love that I know you have for them. You guys, we can only do it that way. But that's the calling. That's what is necessary, the entirety. It means everybody, no filters, we're good at filtering. No conditions, we're good at laying down conditions. None of that. Now, it's interesting that God puts on Paul's heart to even still uh, point out kings and authority. Because aren't they a part of everybody? Yes, yes they are. Do you remember who was the king? Who was the Caesar at the time that Paul wrote this? He was a bad guy named Nero. Soon, like he was already known for not liking Christians. Soon he would be that madman, the one who would sew animal skins on Christians and throw them to the packs of the wild dogs the one who would paint the tar on the Christians and mount them to poles in his garden. And at nighttime, he would light them on fire to produce light as he walked through his garden. That's the man that Paul is pointing out. Pray for him. That's near. We think we got it bad. We watched these hearings over this last week or two and we're like, that's who's representing me? That's the person? Wait a minute, what about Nero? Paul said, lift them up, man. Take them to Jesus. We're supposed to have a heart of love and a heart of grace and a heart of mercy. And that does get hard. And whatever side you're on in all of this stuff that's going on in Washington, something's going to bring turmoil to you, huh? Now, whether it's the president, whether it's congressperson or whatever else, but the Bible still tells you, beloved, Lift them up. Pray the best. Seek only the best for them. 
And that's what, that's God, God will honor that prayer. We, we know he will. We don't know how. You know, pray for the president and the vice president and the cabinet and the senate and the, who else, the house and the governors and the state assemblies and the mayors and the city council and the law enforcement, anybody who's been placed in authority. And let us not forget, God put them there. Okay, so if you say something like, well, I'm not going to pray for that person because he doesn't deserve it, you're telling God you made a big fat mistake. And I don't think we want to tell God that. He says, pray for every one of them. Okay, the entirety. He goes on, though, Paul here, to give you a further reason. Like he actually lays out, by the way, here's the reasons why you should be lifting up everybody and particularly your authority. Look in verses two, three, and four. He goes, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The pretty substantial stuff. Here's one reason you and I pray for Washington and downtown Prescott government and all that. Because by and large, okay, this is not an absolute. By and large, peace, tranquility comes of it. Again, I know we all have exceptions. We can say, well, wait a minute. What about then or what about there? Nevertheless, biblically speaking, we're told to do it because this is a result that the Lord will impose. And when you and I, you guys live in, in, this, in this peace and in this quiet life, by the way, peace means internal tranquility and quiet life means external tranquility, okay? That's, that's the way he's differentiating it there. He's saying when you have that before you, you certainly have a, an opportunity to live in a godly way, in a dignified way. That's true. But you know we cannot read too much into it because if there's not peace, if there's not tranquility, is that an excuse for not living godly and dignified? <laughs> no way. In fact, it's almost all the more reason why we're to live in a godly and dignified way. They're going to yell at you. You're going to pray for them. They're going to be cussing. You're going to be worshiping. They're going to be demeaning. You're going to be encouraging. This is the way Christians are called to live. Nevertheless, that is one of the results. Now, what else? He says this, it is ple oh, well, naturally, number three, this is good and is pleasing in the sight of God. Um, God is blessed when you live like God. God is blessed when you live like Jesus. God is blessed when you're able to step up, you guys, and imitate Christ in the worst of persecution, okay? It pleases your God. You bring a smile to God's face when you do that. And then it goes on to this. Who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth? What I did here was give you another note because this is a key element to your prayers for them. And what I put there was you pray evangelistically. When we pray for everybody, we pray that they may be saved. We pray, Lord, I do pray for Donald Trump that he certainly does know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, right? We do pray for, for, the, other, for the other ones. What was his name? Schiff. A Adam Schiff, I think, was his name, right? Uh, that he knows Jesus as his Lord and Savior. That's always number one on the list. Because I know that if they truly surrender themselves to God, that will be the catalyst for change. Not some rule, not some law, not some guy getting kicked out of office or being kept in office. That's why we pray evangelistically first. Pray, Lord, do it. Pray for your city council. 
pray for these guys. You know, um, I, I told you I, the first Thursday of every month, I go and pray with ma the mayor, and he's telling me all the time, there are people on that city council who don't know Jesus. As praying for him, he wants to be an example to them. That's why they, you know, he wants to always get Christian pastors to open up the city council uh, meetings, you know, with the pastors. And like Pastor Paul just went last week and he opened up their city council meeting with a prayer. We're praying for them. He's praying for them. We want to see them change from the inside out. And that'll trickle out to all other things. Okay, so that's a big deal evangelistically. Notice, please, too, I'm going to take a little bit of a tangent. I never do that. I'm going to take just a little bit of a tangent here because <laughs> I want to point this out, okay? Verse 4, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, I have said all means all, and that's all that all means, and this is one of those key areas where my Bible has a highlight in the word all. Because there are those who say that God will only save those whom he has chosen to be saved. And that those who haven't been chosen, essentially he has designated to hell. This is what's known as divine election. It's a Calvinist doctrine. It's known as divine election. And therefore, Jesus' death on the cross, his blood that was spilled, is only effective for those particular individuals, not everybody. And this is known as limited atonement. Divine election and limited atonement. I, I heartily disagree, and I'm not here to get in a debate with, with, any, with anybody, okay? If you're on that side, you're wrong, and that's all there is to it. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> but I mean, really, you know, you analyze the language here, which I did, and, and it's really that plain and simple. It's that God wants all people to be saved. John 3.16, to me, in the original language, is very clear. The gift, that Jesus, uh, the gift of Jesus was sufficient for the whole world. Now, it doesn't mean that everybody will be saved. Because it says here, God wants all to be saved, right? So, the, the, the gift for salvation goes to everybody. But God doesn't force anybody to be saved. It is the choice of every individual Jesus in Revelation said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Revelation 3, verse 20. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with me and, uh, and eat with him and he with me. It doesn't say, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if you don't answer, I will kick the door down. <laughs> right? I will force you to believe in me. I will force you to receive me. No, that's not what the Bible says. By the way, that's another doctrine in Calvinism. That you can't reject your appointment as a saved individual. Um, so I took that little tangent to say, as far as my analysis of the language goes in various verses, I don't see the exceptions. However, I know the arguments. Okay, I know them and I understand that's an ongoing debate. Um, verse, let's go on, okay? Another part then to salvation here. Remember, we're in pray evangelistically. Um, in verse four, to come to the knowledge of the truth. People don't just walk along and bam, they're saved. Everything's good. They are in Christ, done. They need to know the gospel. They need to have knowledge of the message of the cross. Uh, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ, hearing through the gospel message. That's what they need to know. They need to have that knowledge of the truth. What happens is they hear those words from you, O oh, carrier of the gospel, O oh, sharer of the gospel, 
They hear the words from you. And the Holy Spirit, in that supernatural way, he uses those words as they, they go into that person's head and in that person's heart. And he brings them to conviction. And they realize, oh, I am a sinner worthy of death, but Jesus paid the price for me. And they receive him by faith and they become saved. That's how the person becomes saved. It says they have to come to a knowledge of the truth and then the transformation happens. See, I've heard pastors basically give the message and just say, oh, by the way, do you want Jesus? And it's almost like, do you want to try him out? And you know, because if you don't like him, go on to the next God. You guys, when you share Jesus, know, know it, know the gospel, okay? When I share Jesus with you, I need to tell you why it is that he's necessary. That's why I, I don't just say, believe in Jesus, period, but there's more to it. So evangelistic prayer, would you just couple that with knowledge as well? You gotta know, when you're praying for somebody to be saved, be equipped so that you can share with them the message of truth. All right, let's move, let's move on here. The next word that I have is, <laughs> okay, this one I stretched a little, connectivity, all right? I think it makes sense, nevertheless, um, well, for there is one God. Would you look at the scripture, please? There is one God. There is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Christianity is a monotheistic religion. That means one God for all time. One God who always was, who always is, who always has been. There will be no other. Um, Isaiah 43.10. By the way, have that stored away for Mormons. Isaiah 43.10. Before me, no God was formed, and after me, none will come. Okay, Isaiah 43.10. When, when, relig when a religion, I don't like using that word, but you get the context, okay? When a religion claims that there are many gods, it sort of makes sense to say then there are many paths to God. There are many ways to salvation. But when Christianity maintains, when the God of the Bible maintains, no, there is only I myself, that's God speaking, well then he gets to decide how it is that people will come to him. And in this sense, what he has done is chosen that one path. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. He is known as the mediator between God and man. There is one God and therefore one mediator. Now, what is a mediator? Technically, it's, it's basically somebody who brings two people together. That's really what a mediator is. You notice how... Paul emphasizes the man, Christ Jesus. I think, I think he emphasizes the humanity of Jesus because it's such a, it's, it's a concept that will floor you if you think too much about it. For you and me to, to be brought to God Almighty? No way. He's God. It just doesn't, how? But because there is the God-man but because he did something that only he could do. He left heaven, he came to this earth, and he became a man. He did something that is beyond what you and I can think or imagine. But because of what he did, it enabled him to be the one mediator. He had to be a man in order to mediate. However, he still has to be God to be a mediator. Here's my picture. Here's the Jesus hand, the divine, grabbing God's hand. And here's the Jesus hand, the man, grabbing man's hand. And he goes like this, and he brings them together. That's kind of this picture I have in my mind, okay? Ah, there's some weaknesses in it, but um, that's this mediator. He's the bridge builder. You've heard Jesus called the bridge builder before. 
he's standing, I mean, he's, he's about to die. And he's in the upper room with his guys, and they're like, oh, Lord, you know, and they've got all these questions. One of the things he told them, to set their hearts at ease. Okay, this was to Thomas, but to all the disciples. He goes, no, 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 wait, I am the way, right? He goes, I am the truth, and I am the life. You men have relationship with me. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus was not ignorant of the fact that he was making a rather exclusive claim. You share this with people, you share um, Christ with people, and they'll say, well, I have my God, I have my way. And they don't understand a lot, John 14, that Jesus actually acknowledged himself as exclusive. So he's the mediator. This is what Paul says as part of that um, aspect to prayer. Acknowledge the connectivity that Jesus alone gives you to God, okay? Now, how did Jesus become the mediator? Verse 6 actually tells you why just him. Look at it. Gave, he who gave himself as a ransom, as a ransom for all. That is the reason why he alone was that sufficient mediator. What's a, what's a ransom? Ransom is a price required to be paid to free a captive. That's what a ransom is. If somebody ransoms Rod, you know, and they say, okay, well, for me, they'd say, $50 million, okay? $50 million. $50 million, $60 million ransom. No, but if, if they gave a price and you decided to undercut and say, well, how about half? You know, they're, they're going to say, his head's coming off if you don't change and give me all. Ransom is the price required to free a captive. What are you and I captive to? The Bible says sin. What is the price required to be paid? Death. That's it. The only price that could, that could satisfy the freeing from sin is death. The problem is none of us can pay that. The Bible says if you die in your sins, you are dead once and for all. So our own death doesn't pay the price. Well, lo and behold comes this Jesus, this God, and he becomes a man. And he becomes, I mean, he's sinless. And here's what the Bible says. He knew what the price was, death. But it had to be death of perfection. It had to be death of the one who was sinless. And so he said, okay, Father, I'm going to go and I'm going to pay the ransom. And that's why he hung on the cross. It was that death that paid it all once and for all. That's why Jesus could be the mediator, you guys. That's the answer. He alone could pay the price required to free you and me from the, from the grip of sin. So is he that guy? Yeah. It's, it's okay. Again, this was one of those studies, you guys, where I'm sitting in my room and I'm just like, oh my God, oh man, oh man. I'm just loving God all the more. This is one of those studies. But we got we to gotta move on. You're keeping me here. Um, we got him going on here to say this, okay? So he goes, the testimony given at the proper time. He, he, this is Paul continuing. What does he mean very simply when he states that to the, uh, to the Ephesians, to Timothy and the others? He's just saying, would you remind yourself and remind them? This was perfect. You remember how the Old Testament has like 300 plus prophecies about Jesus? You know, his life, his birth, his death, his resurrection. He's just saying, in God's perfect time, it all came to pass. The ransom was paid. The gospel message has been completed. Here's what you are to now do. And that's, that's, that's it. I mean, that's, it's so cool. You know, Micah chapter 5, 700 years before Christmas. Eh, the, little, the little prophecy, uh, Micah 5 verse 2, basically this. Hey, you little tiny village of Bethlehem, from you, the ruler will arise. I mean, like Bethlehem? That's like Paulden. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> what good comes from Paulden? <laughs> now, if you're from Paulden, you are the exception, okay? <laughs> 
that, but that's it. That's 700 years before Jesus. Anyway, Paul goes, hey, hey, ah, oh, the timing. It's just, it was perfect at the proper time testimony given, all right? And then he says, here then is what it means for me. I was appointed a preacher, heralder. You know what a herald is? A herald is somebody who is chosen by the king to take the message to the people. If you heralded for a king, that means he said, here, take this message, go, go to Paulden and tell the people about me. That's what Paul was. You guys, you're preachers because you have the message of the king. And you are called to tell it. I am a preacher. I am called to tell it. That's that. You got the message. You've experienced the message. Go herald, okay? That's our call. And an apostle, that means I have official authority from Jesus himself. So you better listen to me. Which is why he goes, I am telling the truth. I am not lying. Because people knew. If he really proved himself to be an apostle, they're, they're done. His words really are of God. So he's an apostle. And then what? A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Simply, I heralded, people heard, people came to Christ, and then I uh, discipled, uh, you know, pastored, uh, taught. I don't want to say pastored because you guys, this is for you as well. You're going to herald the gospel. People are going to receive it. And then you, God has put in their life to continue with them. Huh? If you can, tell them about Jesus more. If you can, take the notes from today's study and say, hey, I want you to look at something that I learned today. That's part of your, that's part of your call. You guys, you're not just to sit there on your own. But you're supposed to get yourself involved in the lives of other people. You got to be involved in other people's spiritual health. You got to, you know, you got to be their, their, um, the, the, the one who trains with them at the gym. You got to be that person in the spirit. Anyway, Paul says, I did it all. By the way, Jesus called me on the road to Damascus and said, you're going to go and take my message to all the Gentiles. And he's going, yeah, that's, that's what happened. So, okay, you guys, we're done then with the principles of prayer. Pray about the principles of prayer. One of your uh, discussion questions that I have in there was um, to add to that list. Remember the variety? Prayer is definitely even more comprehensive than what Paul teaches the church in this, in this set of scriptures. So what I want to pose to you is do some, do some study on your own. What else would you add to the list? What other principles would you highlight to a church? Let's say you were the writer and you knew that Ephesus was indeed in trouble if they weren't careful. Well, where, what else would you write? Now, I don't mean to undercut the Holy Spirit, okay? That's not at all what I'm talking about. But what would the Lord put on your heart to tell fellow Christians? They wanted them dead. Remember, they start executing Christians. What would you say to Christians who actually their lives were on the line when they went out into their neighborhoods? What would you say to them? Pray for more faith? I would say that. Pray for new doors of opportunity to show that you have the kind of strength that this doesn't scare you? I would say that. I'd say pray for power. Anyway, anyway. That's the stuff I want you to be talking about, okay? It's, it's a sweet, sweet time with you and the Lord. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. I am not going into a study of this. I only want to tell you what that means in, plain, in the plain reading of the scripture. Paul is saying, your church, Timothy, will die <laughs> if you don't do it this way, son. And then he says, point to the men of the church and call them to lead in this fight. That's what that means. He goes, I want the men to bear this burden first. I want the men to be the ones who, who lead this charge. I want those guys to be the prayers. I want those guys to be the heralders. I want men of the church to act like men the way God designed them to be. 
That's why he says that right here. Now, if you read the rest, ladies, I know, I know there's questions. Please come for next week's study, would you? Okay, don't not come. I'll, I'll teach you. Still, guys, I just want to say the burden is yours. Primarily, the burden is mine. Ladies, yeah, you got to pray, you got to herald. But there's something to it. Man, when the, when the walls are kind of caving in, there's, there's force being pushed against your church. Guys, we're the ones who stand up to that wall and we push back. We are empowered by the Spirit of God. That's what we got to do. No, he says, he says, didn't I say I wasn't going to preach on this? But still, he says, lifting holy hands. What does that mean? What does that mean? You think about all things holy and you, you get rid of your own sort of self-pride. You lift up holy hands means all I want to do is be like Jesus in the fight. Because so many guys insist on doing it their way. It says lift up holy hands. It says without anger, without quarreling. Some of your Bibles say without doubting. That seems to be a man thing, doubting, quarreling, anger. I'll talk to you about it next week. So I gave you a conclusion ver uh, note that I want you to fill in, please. And this was just me saying keys to the gospel. Okay, so your prayers and you are heralders. Let me, let's, let's remind ourselves some of the keys to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number one, it's inclusiveness. What did we say? All should be saved. Okay, number two, let's just go right on. It's exclusiveness. Salvation will only come through Christ alone. Number three, this is the one I want you to fill in, please. Jesus' sacrifice is the essence. That's where you would write the word ransom. Hey, heralder, listen, some of you haven't heralded in a long time. Okay, understand your commission as a Christian is to tell people the gospel. If I were to ask you, when's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? I think some of you here would say, not even in 2019. That's not, that's not right. Here's what I want to do is just give you something to think about. You herald the gospel. Would you just think of those three key elements? Let the Holy Spirit spin it around. Just remember, it's inclusiveness. God looks at everybody and says, I want him. I want her. Would you look at everybody and say, but they need Jesus, exclusiveness. And then would you just look at them and say, ah, oh, the payment is in full. All they need to know is that message. He paid the price. And they'll take it. The Holy Spirit will work with it, okay? Be that person. You guys, we're at the end. The walls, people are pushing in on the walls of, your, of you personally and on our church. You ask my, my friends here, the pastors, they're saying, man, things are happening and they're weird. And what they mean as a type of persecution we've never experienced before. Hey, I'm not shocked. Are you I'm not shocked? But it means we have to step up. Okay? Prayers and heralders for the glory of God. Let's pray.